Um, I, what first strikes me about that, that reading is, is two things um, which, which run through the entire kind of novel is A, it's your attention to detail and your observations um, and B, the humour okay, and that, that kind of playfulness um, is quite striking in the sense that there's this looming kind of violence behind this story as well you know, her husband is a paramilitary loyalist paramilitary um, a violent kind of man, and she maps her everyday existence <coughs> through these details and, and with this humour. And this humour is a is a kind of guarded kind of defence mechanism. You know, she's she's building guards for herself by observing everybody else's kind of glitches and mistakes and kind of the misinformations and kind of wrong transmissions and things like that. Before we go into that kind of detailed aspect of the novel. Yeah. I'm obsessed with um, titles. Okay. okay. And when I used, I used to be a university lecturer and I used to teach on the MA programme and I used to annoy the hell out of my students by giving entire lectures and seminars just on the title of the novel we're going to teach, we're going to read, okay? And they would hate it, like, you, know, uh, you know, hours and then a seminar on the title and I'd love it. Um, so. The first thing that strikes me about this book, uh, it's a beautiful title. There's two things about it, okay? Three dreams in the key of G. Mm -hmm. Firstly, I haven't got a musical bone in my body, but I understand that the key of G is a kind of universal kind of key that embodies kind of human experience and emotion, okay. traditionally, okay? It's a novel of triptychs, three yes. voices. Why, why dreams? Can you just talk us through the title? Why, a, why are they? Why, why dreams? And what is it about the key of G that resonates for you and through and through the novel? Well, on the on the dreams, um, for me, two of the voices, which are not the one I just read, who's the mother. One is a crone, <coughs> who's a seventy-year-old woman in Florida who runs a, a battered uh, shelter for victims of domestic abuse. Uh, but she, her community is currently surrounded by FBI, ATF and DEA in a, in a siege not unlike the standoff at Waco. Um, so she, her existence is really only on the internet because she's reaching out, she's communicating, because she is literally besieged and they cannot leave their, their physical space. And the, the third voice is the creatrix, which is the human genome, or, or the, the, the genetic code of all of us that, that creates us in the womb and continues to determine aspects of our life, you know, until death. Uh, which, you know, it, it creates... Our genetics create our consciousness, but genetics themselves have no consciousness at all. So again, at what level of reality does that voice exist? So the crone only seems to exist online, and we all know how unreliable that is. And the human genome obviously doesn't exist in the form in which it is portrayed in the book. So they are quite dreamlike voices. And for me, the key question is the voice of the mother who dominates the novel. She has twice as much of the novel as the other two voices. And the question is, well, how much of her voice is, is reliable? And you know, how much is she as dreamlike uh, as, as the other two? And I say that because, on the one hand, she's informed by my own personal observations and experiences of being a parent, uh, doing lots of childcare, apologies to my sons who are here in the audience tonight. Um, so there's a lot of kind of, that's where the detail comes from. But on the other hand, I sit it in Northern Ireland, which is a country I've never visited. I've never been to. Uh, now, Franz Kafka wrote a novel called America, and he'd never left the continent of Europe. So uh, it can be done. <laughs> but, but for me, what's interesting is Northern Ireland has obsessed me since I was a child. And the reason was because every night on the TV news there were images from Northern Ireland where the cars are the same, the number plates are the same style, the road signs are the same style, you saw Woolworths and other recognisable shops. So it was my country. And yet, amongst the pedestrians there were soldiers with rifles, and on the, in amongst the cars were armoured cars. And as a, you know, eight, nine, ten, however old I was, that had a very powerful impact on me. But whatever space it's taken in my psyche, emotionally and intellectually, it's entirely been mediated by coming through television. Mm. You know, so how much of my own understanding of Northern Ireland 
that bear, you know, how much does that bear any? It, it's funny you say that. I mean, I come from an Irish family, and uh, I know County Tyrone and Omer and Ochnacloy and all those areas, and I've been there, and um, and I, I, the, the 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 voice that that permeates is a strong voice, and. All the women in my family, Irish, are strong women. They can handle anything. And it's the men who are the, the weaker, who, who, who cause all the bother, who have caused all the efforts, you know. And it's the women who have, who have just tidied everything up, for want of a better analogy, and, and got on with things. And there's, that, that, I do see that distinct voice in it. It's remarkable for somebody who's never visited that part of the world. Or being a mother. Yeah, or being a mother. <laughs> <laughs> um, that you, you, the, I, there's recognize, you know, recognisable kind of nuances in that kind of, um, that kind of the barriers that she puts up and that that kind of strength of character she has. But I think for me that comes from this could be in any combat zone or conflict zone where. It isn't always mothers, but it is pretty much always mothers because the fathers are off fighting. Um, so there's that tension between the mother wanting to protect and shield the children from violence, from prejudice, from bigotry. But on the other hand, the social expectation is you will bring up children for the cause, whichever side of the divide you're on, mm. that's irrelevant, it's the same mechanism. So the mothers are very much trying to straddle a really difficult tightrope between protecting their children, shielding their children, and yet letting enough of it to come in so that they will not be disloyal. They will not abandon their allegiance. Um, and I think that, I was very keen for that to permeate. Okay, so, and, and just to touch on the key of G, what, what is, what? Full disclosure. <laughs> the this is for me personally, I just what, want to know. But... You're going to hate this answer. <laughs> Full disclosure. So I had an original title for the book which was very much bound up with the cover art and uh, when you get a publishing deal you, as a writer you very rarely get any say in the cover art which I understand yeah. and quite quickly my conception was rejected I understand <laughs> I, was, I was a bit in two minds about it because it was kind of jokey and throwaway which didn't quite fit the tone of the book so I didn't mind letting it go but the title relied on that artwork, so if the artwork wasn't going to happen, okay. so the title had to go. So I had to kind of think at quite short notice, and I went back to the first novel I ever tried to write at age 18, where in my gap year I had the ridiculous notion I was going to write the great British novel, even though I'd lived no life at all by age 18. But the one thing I salvaged from it was the title. Excellent. Because it fit. Okay, oh. yeah, I like that. <laughs> okay, I like that. And, uh, yeah. So not the answer you were expecting. Not, I, I mean, it tinges on nostalgia, but we'll, we won't, you okay. know, but it's, it's fine. Um, but I like that because you, you, are, you are bringing something of, you know, back into kind of fruition, you know, which means something to you in that sense, I guess. Well, I think, you know, I think any author is writing from their own experience. I don't think you can write from something you haven't experienced because even if you're writing about something that's quite alien to you, you'll probably go and research it. Mm. Or someone's told you a story and you might incorporate that story in it. So it becomes part of your experience. It's not, you haven't lived it, it's not, but it's significant enough that you've remembered it and then put it. So I think anything is autobiographical. And in the same way that, as I say, Northern Ireland had this incre incredible resonance with me at age 9, 10, 11. And then at age 18, I took this title. So I think it's constantly a process of review of your own material. Yeah. It's funny, when I uh, started reading this, I got my wife who can play the piano, so give me the key of G. Which is more than I could do. <laughs> I was like, okay, what's this timber? What's this residence? You know, okay, but okay, that's cool. Um, so, <laughs> so um, all right, so we, we'll, we'll go into the kind of triptych. Okay, okay this, yep. this, this obsession with three. Yes. Throughout, that runs throughout yes. the novel. And you have the three voices, the mother, who we've just heard, mm -hmm. okay, the, uh, crone yep. and creatrix, yep. okay. Um, crone, to me, is the old gnarled kind of hag within folklore who is is the kind of misogynist's version of the wise old man yes. do you know what i mean and because it's a woman that we focus on the, the physical aspects mm -hmm. which is she's the old lady blah 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 but it's the equivalent of the wise you know the sage okay in mythical folklore this strong protector yeah. Okay, who can protect? Okay, and then you have the creatrix, who's the kind of 
the, 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 the goddess kind of who brings forth, who is the author of life. everything, yeah. of life itself, okay? Yeah. I've got a sense, though, that you're not looking at it mythologically or through folklore. I get a sense that for you, it's 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 a more kind of um, you're looking at the uh, not the etymological kind of um, kind of meanings of this, but you're looking at it through language, yes. and you're looking at the the, the the idea of the crone through language and the creatrix through language and through gender and through gender particularly. I think. Okay, yeah. So can you talk us through? We've got a sense of uh, mother. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, but can you talk us through crone? Because crone. Um, they all share the same kind of name as well as characters. As, oh, yeah. They're not characters. Yeah. I'm not going to. Yeah. They're not characters. He's like me. We don't. I don't write characters. I can't. I don't. We write voices. We write voices. <laughs> yeah. Uh, ciphers. That's a good word. Yeah. I, I don't like characters. Ciphers. But um, um, but I want you to talk us through Chrome because for me she's really interesting because it's a for me it's a it's a rewriting and a, a, a correcting of a kind of. Uh, misogynized kind yeah. of version of, of, of a, 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 a sage who happens to be female. Yeah. Okay. And uh, she's a kind of kick-ass character yeah. who is hell bent <coughs> trying to destroy the patriarchy from her computer. Mm -hmm. And the whole complex that she's created, which was a uh, started off as a um, a refuge for women who suffered domestic violence is now under siege by law, federal law enforcement agencies, yeah. um, as you said, in that kind of Waco kind of style. Yeah. Yeah. And she's steadfast, and she's, put, again, putting up barriers and protection. Um, can you talk us through what, what, what Crone is for you, and, and, and what, is, what does she stand for? What is this idea of the, the female being under siege and, uh, and protecting and also trying to... For me, it's very current, you know, this idea that we need to break down the patriarchy, you know, and, and abolish it and get rid of that sort of thinking and mythologizing of the world. Is that what you're trying to address? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty sort of clear-cut in the Crone's character in that she was threatened with domestic violence but was canny enough to recognise its menace and escaped. Um, <coughs> And then she sort of set about, on an individual scale, sort of dreaming, fantasising revenge on her partner or her ex-partner. But from that, at the same time, gradually, she, you know, obviously there are other women who do suffer. So she does set up this, sh initially it is a shelter for, yeah. for battered women. But she can't let go of what brings them all together, which is male violence, domestic male violence. Um, so she comes up with a scheme. But basically, she has a sort of a feminist interpretation of the history of measurement, how we measure things, how science measures things, how we measure the earth, and how sort of detrimental that is to the environment it's because it's penetrative, it's a male way of doing things. So initially, she's going to have an assault on the system of measurement. But technology being what it is, how we measure things changes. So initially, there, there, you know, there still is, I think, in somewhere outside Paris, a brick of two metals uh, in alloy. And the, the, there's two metals because that way it doesn't expand or contract the temperature. And there's a line drawn across it, and that represents one metre. Uh, but of course, you know, people were using metres you know, centuries before they, you know, they came up with that 18th century physical manifestation of it. In the same way, as people use, as babies or toddlers use words long before they know how to spell them, long before they're able to, you know, go to school and write stuff. So it's, it's a similar sort of, you know, backwards way of doing things. But she's caught out because technology moves on and we no longer rely on a, a brick in outside Paris to measure a metre. It's, it was done with uh, radioactive decay of cesium 56 atoms, something like that, 53, 56. And now it's all light, waves of light. So it's gone digital. She, there's no material thing for her to assault. So she has to abandon that project. And, but the Human Genome Project, which was in the 90s, which is to, to decode you know, the genetic map of all humans, gives her another opportunity by which she thinks that she can redress the balance on the patriarchy by doing her own version of sort of genetic terrorism. Yeah, okay. For want of a better word. Um, 
and that is why uh, she is surrounded. Okay, um, and is this a symbol for anything? This kind of under siege. Every character, all your characters are under siege. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. and they're all trying to fight their way through something or out of something or towards something. Okay, so. Are these all kind of symbols of, of, of the patriarchal society? That no, you, I, think it's wi I think it's wider than that. I mean, they are under siege. For example, the, the creatix, the human genome, I've made female. You know, there's no reason in, in the real world for that. To, I don't think you'd have to talk to scientists. Maybe they see it the same way. I don't know. So that's a conceit on, on my part as the writer. Uh, the crone is definitely a gender war. Mm. The one in Ireland is far more complicated because it's not just her husband, it's the wider conflict. And there are plenty of women on both sides of the divide in Northern Ireland who are just as passionate about you know, the cause as, yep. as the men. So I'm always very keen not to get bogged down on the individual, but to try and make it as universal as possible, to speak for as much of humanity as, as, as you can. So yes, obviously there is a model of uh, you know, pushback against the patriarchy. But it's not, you know, I think a lot of people are in a state of siege in their lives. Not just, you know, for gender reasons, you know, economic, financial, you know, they might suffer emotional or, or physical abuse, all that sort of stuff. So I think a lot of people are, uh, understand what being in a state of siege is. Yeah, it's incredibly I, hard to lift the siege. I would totally agree with that. And I think that's why it's such a kind of um, timely kind of book because it does tap in to that kind of universal sense that you know we you know that sense that things aren't quite right yeah and there's a reason you know or is there a reason why is it inbuilt within us that you know you talk about we'll talk about this but you talk about chance you know the role of the dice yeah and that this kind of repeating kind of genetic code that rears its ugly head cyclically but also and there's there's sort of cultural factors such as you know how how are families valued in our society, you know, is that you know, are children given enough of the correct space? Well, I don't think they are personally. You sure. know, there's so many pressures on children. You know, it could be the internet, advertising, you know, families that that, that uh, you know sort of break up. The housing means you might not longer, any longer have extended communities where in the past kids were part with, you know, neighbours who would you know look after them incredibly. All that sort of stuff. So it's society as well as genetic. Sure. Uh, okay. So that takes us then into that kind of genetic realm, yeah. okay, which some people, uh, I've read reviews, are, are starting to feel is the kind of most kind of complicated, kind of um, challenging aspect of, of the, <coughs> the work, the novel, okay? Mm -hmm. And this is the creatrix, yeah. okay? And this is the kind of four nucleotides yeah. of, of genetic of, structure. Of DNA, which yeah. are Of DNA, which are... So there's four chemical bases, uh, adenine, cytosine, thiamine, and which one I missed out? Guanine, thank you, guanine. Um, and DNA is simply those chemical bases in these chains, just repeating over and over, variant, you know, sometimes A is followed by T, or it might be followed by G further on. That's what DNA essentially is. And it's a four-letter alphabet. That's all there is. We have a 26-letter alphabet that <coughs> produces every work of literature you can imagine and all sort of non-fiction all that sort of thing 26 letters but it cannot begin to compare with the creative generative power of dna which only has four letters which creates this yeah consciousness uh, yeah i mean what you know how where does consciousness come from well ultimately don't ask me oh, no <laughs> the scientists don't know yeah so, i mean they might do in time it comes from dna i mean obviously there's a long process by which you get from you know chemical basis to, to consciousness and all these ideas but so my interest really you said that some people might be a bit sort of wrong you know this is science and stuff I'm a layman like most people in this room you know I've read a bit of Dawkins I've read a, read a bit of Jones you know the popular science stuff so I have no more greater understanding the way I approached it was exactly what I described as language four letter alphabet versus a 26 letter alphabet and the four letter alphabet very confident that it was far, far superior in the potential of what it could create than our 26 letter alphabet. Because the Human Genome Project, in theory, or certainly started out as a quest, if we could map the human genetic code, we might be able to cure all hereditary diseases, which I think we'd all approve of, very noble. But at the same time, you start to get these questions. Is there a gene for criminality? 
Is there a gene for violence? Is there a gene for sexual orientation? You know, the sinister, sinister side of, mm -hmm. of science, you know, how it can be sort of, you know, Shanghai for, for, for those, those, sorts of, those sorts of purposes. Um, so what, what struck me about this section of the novel, I mean, I, it, uh, it's completely my thing, this idea of, of the alphabet and language. Mm. Now, I'm obsessed with, with our language and how much it fails us and how much we kind of... Uh, it, I think Beckett put it best, he called it, um, uh, I think he called it the skullscape. So he sees this horizon in his mind, yeah. and he wants to reach it on the page, and all he has is language to reach that horizon. Yeah. But language isn't enough, it fails him time and time and time again, because language doesn't quite work properly, okay? Yeah. And that, in, and you know, and, but novelists were led to believe, you know, open up this kind of consciousness and world and universe in their books with these 20, combinations of 26 letters. But most novels fail. They're not true representations of the reality around us. We're just told they are. They're just mediation upon mediation upon mediation. And we're led to believe, as readers, that we are stepping into reality. We're not. We're stepping into a combination of 26 letters told through the schoolscape, trying to reach that the reachable horizon. There's a very famous painting by, uh, I think it was Belgian, René Magritte, where it's a picture of a pipe. Uh, you know, yeah. a smoker's pipe, and the motto he's painted underneath it is, this is in French, Ceci n'est-ce un pipe, this is not a pipe. And, the, and it's called the treachery of images, or imagery. And the point he's making is, this is not a pipe, this is a painting of a pipe. But there's a further layer, it's not a pipe, it's not a painting of a pipe, it's a painting of the symbol by which we understand pipe. Because equally, he could have had a drain pipe, this is not a pipe, or a duct <coughs> pipe, this is not a pipe, or a hose pipe. This is where language begins to break down. Yeah. And whenever you crack open a new novel, uh, you don't know what world you're about to enter, unless you've read up on it beforehand. And, and you will either be presented with a world that's very recognisable, which is what we call realism, or you're presented with a world where you're asked to suspend certain dis uh, belief <coughs> in order to enter the world of the novel. And my approach is, not, is, is to reject both of those. I personally, as a writer and a reader, I'm not very interested in realism for some of the reasons you yeah, were saying. Not. You can't paint pictures, and let's face it, most of our sense of reality is a visual one. You can't paint pictures in words. You can do it in paint, but even that, as Magritte says, that's only a representation or a symbol, whatever you want to call it. So I'm not very interested in, in realism. And also, to me, realism is a recreation of what we see around us, rather than a create, you know, a novel is a work of the imagination, it isn't a creation, it is something new. So there's a difference between a recreation and a creation. So I reject realism, for me, I mean, I'm not saying nobody can do it, you know, writers can write what the heck they like, obviously. Uh, the other one is, I don't want people to suspend their belief when they open one of my novels. I want to be aware that this is a work of fiction. Yeah. Because to me, then, that might enable them to start asking questions of well what is reality? You know, what do we take what we take as true is not necessarily so. Um, yeah. so when when your visual when your eyes are looking at something, it's only actually recording between ten and fifteen percent of what's in front of you. Because what it's doing is you know, your brain has a set of templates of what reality looks like. <coughs> and it's comparing you know, that 50% is basically scanning for anything that varies from the template, going back to our sort of prehistory of flight or fight response, you know, threats to the environment. Um, so there's that aspect of, of reality that's constructed. It's, it's templates in the back of the brain, it's pictures in the back of the brain. Doesn't, you know, doesn't matter what you're seeing to a large extent. So there's that, that aspect of, re of reality. It's a construction. It's a consensus. And the interesting thing for, for me, which is not really in the book, is how do those templates get put in our children? Mm. You know, as they're developing. Um, I don't know the answer to that. So. Well, it, uh, it starts. You, we, we spoke about it earlier, didn't we? It starts at a very young age, where like here's an aeroplane. Mm, yeah. Into your, you know, when we're feeding. But, that, but that's an imaginative association or a country. That's. No one's pretending that's reality. You both know that's a game or a, or a construct. But, you know. 
It's funny when you say that and you want your readers to be aware that it's fiction. Yeah. It's not a work of metafiction, you know, you know you're not postmodern in that way. Um, I don't know if you, you're similar to me, whereas I like to disrupt what I call reading pleasure. So I don't want my books to be escapism. I want people to get annoyed with my books. And I always remember something that um, Alain uh, Rocrelaire said, the, you know, the Nouveau Roman uh, fr uh, French writer, and he said the worst books are the books that do the reading for you. Okay, which are the ones that tell you absolutely everything about your, their characters, what they're thinking, what they're doing, what they're seeing. Okay, and the, but the best books are the ones that don't really tell you anything. Which sums his work up beautifully. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, but you have to do the work. I'm not saying that you have to do the work when reading your novel, but it's not a passive experience. No. It's an active experience. I mean, I was... Um, I was on the internet reading your book, I had dictionaries, yeah. I was scratching my head. I mean, I mean to me, this is, this is what novels should do. They should disrupt that kind of laying on the beach going, oh, isn't life wonderful? Oh, what a wonderful novel of suffering. Anyway, where's the champagne? You know, novels should be that kind of glitch in your kind of... Well, it depends what you want a novel to do. If you want a novel to be a yarn, to kill some time around a port. Plenty of novels are that. If you want a novel to try and help the reader think about you know, what the world around them, that's tough in fiction because you've already described that A, the world around them probably is a fiction, and B, even if it's not, even if there is a single observable objective reality, fictions are Writing a book of fiction is a pretty weird way of trying well, to get to grips with uh, it. Uh, J.G. Ballard always said that um, everything around us is a fiction. The job of the author is to create the, rea the reality, which is in itself a fiction. So it's this kind of well, I th cyclical I think dead it's, end. I think it's, it's, for me anyway, it's to try and help the reader decide to look around and see where the fiction is around them that they've taken for real reality and real life. That's my level of interest. So that's why I don't, you know, I'm not interested in myths. Mm. You know, what would be the point of me writing a book for a new orthodoxy where my myths get substituted for previous myths? So for myth, for you, is mediation. It's just another yeah. retelling of the same. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's the other aspect of, because we talked about, um, you know, the, the human eye and how it works and stuff. The other aspect of, of reality is, is what's called hyper-reality, where my example of either the region or the island yet it has a significant place in my makeup, but it's been entirely absorbed by how it's been presented to me on TV news, documentaries, all that kind of stuff. Hyper-reality is, you know, you're being bombarded with stuff all the time in childhood and in, in adulthood. And sometimes, you know, you can't tell what you've personally experienced and what is being mediated towards you. So you've absorbed it as your experience. Yes. And you, you know, some of your eyes got blurred and you've forgotten the source of it. So if someone tells me an anecdote, and I you, you know, I, oh, that's interesting, I file it away, it's become part of my brain, therefore it's part of my experience, I then use it in one of my novels, I don't know whether the anecdote that that person told me, did it happen to them, or have they done exactly the same? You know, whose anecdote was it? One thing's sure is it was never mine. <laughs> but by putting it in my novel, I've sort of colonised it, and... Uh, you know, am I going to remember that this was never part of my experience? I mean, lived experience. I, you know, I've done a, I do a similar thing. There's uh, one of my recent novels is set on Canvey Island, and I get lots of people from Canvey and the environment saying, "Oh, there's such detail, and you knew the nooks and crannies of every creek, and you know all the names, and you must have done all this research." And I'm like, <laughs> "Well, uh, <laughs> funny you should say funny that." You should yeah. say that. The map I use, I'm obsessed with the flattening of, of kind of things and I'm obsessed with maps, but the map I used to write my kind of reimagining of Canby Island was the lead singer of a, a band called Dr. Feelgood called Lee Brillo, when he was 13 years of age or maybe a bit younger, drew a pirate map of Canby <laughs> Island and all the creeks and names for the creeks are the ones he made up and they're the, the names of the creeks that I put into my novel. But everybody, because I've remediated it back as a novel, think that that's, that's what the creeks yeah. are called, but they're not. <laughs> Mine's just a reimagining of a ten-year-old's pirate map in a novel. But 
people believe this idea of reality. We, we believe those 26 kind of letters. We believe... Yeah, it gives an authority something. Yeah, and, not, and I always say that an author has no real authority on reality around us. You know, we're just putting things together. Which is why I'm always trying to remind people that this is a work of fiction. Yeah. I don't, you know, you don't need to enter its world as, as if it was true, because yeah. it ain't. Yeah, which brings me to the creatrix and yeah. how you have turned each of those four... Um, um, bases, nucleotides bases, and components, yeah. bases, into a voice. Yes. So they each have a distinctive voice, and they're each, <coughs> in my reading of it, in kind of competition, in this kind of, not in... That's interesting. I see them all as a Greek choir. Oh, okay. A classical Greek tragedy choir. So, okay, it, what, what, the chorus of them? Yeah, the, chorus, sorry, yeah. not choir, chorus, yeah. Okay, so... They are in competition. I'm not. You're yeah. right. But are they retelling the the, the, the genetic makeup of what makes um, Crone the person she is and what makes Mother? The person <coughs> well, they, they are. Brother? But that's not. For me, they are pointing out the hubris in the human race. The human race, through the genome project, has said we are going to map ourselves. It's you know intricate, infinitesimally layered thing called DNA. We are going to understand it lock, stock and barrel, and because of that we will take that knowledge and we will cure these diseases. Yeah. Which is a huge hubris. Yeah. And the, the, the creatrix, or the genome, as I, in my head I call it, is constantly chiding the human race in this novel that, you know, you haven't got a clue. You, don't, you, know, you can't begin to approach my divinity, for want of a better word. Um, you know, you, you've got 26 letters, but they're, you know, they're nothing compared to my thought. You know, you, you're obsessed with, with death and reproduction and love, but you know you don't really know what those terms mean. You know you, you, you've embellished it the same way as you've invented gods. Just to interrupt you, yeah. are, are you saying um, are you tapping into the, the, the kind of idea that things like love, emotion is just genetic constructs? Me personally, I don't feel that, but uh, there are plenty of uh, genetic scientists who probably will tell you yes, they are. Yeah. So you have to draw your own conclusions on that. Okay. Uh, it's a grim. If that is, if that is the, the truth, it's a pretty grim prospect. If it, it is all just biology, yeah. um, but I don't happen to believe that. So, so why create a voice out of these four base components? Because are you? Is it a kind of uh, an anger at our, you know, our arrogance? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, we always ask the wrong questions, the human race. So the, you know. The, Philosophy, as far as I understand it, and I'm not an expert, started with the ancient Greeks asking, what is a good life? It seems a reasonable, you know, what is a moral life? And obviously that's taken on by the Christian uh, theologians. But to me the question is, what is life? In, given that we're all going to die, what is life? What is the purpose of life? So to say, what it, to ask the question, what is a good life, and take philosophy largely down that road mm. for 2,000 years, seems to me to be the wrong question. <laughs> um, and then, of course, you know, in the 20th century, you've got the existentialists who said, well, there is no meaning to life, therefore go out and do what you want. Well, yeah. that's, that's not an answer, mm. you know, either. More of an excuse. Yes, you know. So, it's, yes, there is, you know, I do feel that we, as a race, you know, we haven't solved these basic questions about ourselves over two, th two three thousand years, partly because language isn't up to the job. And now we've got this this new pet project called the Human Genome Project, where we're going to we're going to conquer immortality. Mm. Well, a, I don't think we are we will, but if we do, to what purpose when we don't know what life's for in the first place? You know? oh, so, so if we all live forever, that's a nice thought, but you know, have we thought that through? <laughs> through. <laughs> you know. Okay, so ar arrogance is, is leading us into this kind of um, black hole of, of well, potentially. You know, there are sharp enough minds that might be able to steer us along the right path. Sure. You know, we can only hope. Okay. All right. So I want to steer it away from yeah. that, that kind of, you know, not negative, but you know, it's a, you know, it's, it's a foreboding kind of aspect of the book. It's a book of of poignant images. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and real crystallised images. I just want to read. Well, there's there's two things that. There's all that going on. I mean, yeah. there's a lot going on in this book. Yeah. But essentially, it's a book about mothers, yes. identity, and and growth. Those growing from from the child into the world around us. Yeah, child development. Yeah. yeah. And um, so that ties its way through the, the novel. Okay. Yeah. 
there's a beautiful image in it. For me, I'm a father, you know, um, you know, and I have two children. But there, it's just this, it's the mother in Ireland. There she was, and she's talking about her daughter. Yeah, so there, she, just, just to frame it, the mother has had a, a telephone call and is caught on the phone. She's breastfeeding or, I can't remember, bottle feeding what, the, the younger child. The old, slightly older child wants her attention, can't get it because she's on the phone, so the, that child stomps off. She puts the phone down, the, 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 tod, toddler, the tot in her arm has fallen asleep, she puts it in the cot, then she goes off in search of the one who stomped off because she wants to make, you know, yeah. make reparations or amends or whatever. And then she, she can't find her, and then she's approaching her own bedroom, the mother's bedroom door. She just spies through the crack of it, there's movement, and she realises her daughter's in there. Yeah. She said, there she was, sat at my dressing table, in front of my hinged, <coughs> mirrored triptych, that gateway to the source of identity. And I think that kind of sums up the, the kind of repeated kind yeah, of generational, generational yeah. cyclical mirroring of generations. But there's something beautiful, I think, about the hinged, mirrored triptych. And we've all seen those kind of mirrors, you know, with the hinges. You don't just see yourself, you see a pers different perspective of yourself. You see angles of yourself and you can move that perspective, okay, yeah. to make, to see certain aspects of your features, maybe your good side, or maybe like, oh gosh, I've got that huge poop on my face, and, you know, and you can manoeuvre the perception of yourself through this mirror, okay, mm -hmm. and we're doing this, and mothers and, and children, and I see my daughter do this, you know, and we don't have a hinged trick to be yeah. aware, but you know, she, she looks at herself in the mirror and then, you know. Um, but this is, this is this idea of mirroring of identity. In a sense, it's, I don't want to start talking about Lacan and all that, but it's, it's kind of, you know, it's inbuilt, isn't it, from a very young age. Yes. The, that our reality of ourselves is a reflection. It's, it's, a, it's a mirroring, but it's repeated. We, we, we copy, we see our mothers doing it, our father, you know, I have, I have images of my father. Friday, I come from a very working class family. And one of the, uh, my father's very ill now, and, but um, one of my amazing images that always stays with me, on a Friday night, he would go to the pub to meet his mates. And he would, in the, I lived in a terrace house in Manchester, and the hallway was tiny and had this big mirror in it, by the phone, and my dad would be there with his top off, stinking of like aftershave <laughs> for ages. I mean, and we would like make a joke of it. We'd be like in the living room, just going, "Just stop there." And he'd be like, you know, doing his hair, and then he'd run back upstairs, put on his new shirt, or whatever, and he'd come into the front room and go, "How do I look?" <laughs> and he'd do this kind of, "How do I look?" And then he'd be out to the pub. And that, that, and I seriously, I have this joke with myself that like, when I'm getting ready, I mean, I'm not, you know, the, you know, <laughs> satirical, um, satirical, satirical, yeah. 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 but um, I have this joke with myself, if I see myself in the mirror, I do, I ape my father's words, I go, how do I look? And I do it to my wife as a joke, how do I look? And it, it's just, and I, <laughs> but it comes part of family law, it becomes, and the inheritance part of Exactly, yeah. so this is what, I, I mean, this is what I find remarkable about that, just two, three lines about this child looking in that triptych mirror. It ties in with the triptych of the narrative yeah. and everything. But it, what, what, are you, what, what happens is, is the mother straight away is taken back to the time. She is a little girl sat in front of her own mother's triptych mirror. So you've got three generations. Yeah. So not only three. You, not, so yeah, but three. not only have you got three mirrors, mirror images. You've got you've got cubes because you've got the mother doing the same thing in the grandmother's mirror. And that is the inheritance, because the dress, the mirror isn't her family heirloom, but the dresser is. Okay. So it is literally passed down. And is this mirroring kind of genetic code? Is this kind of? Well, that's the interesting question. Is it? Is it? You know, is it genetic, or is it? You know, is it encultured, encultured gender. Yeah. You know, the one of the points about the book is, you know, it asks the question, you know, what, you know, what is nature, what is nurture in terms of child development, and in areas where your child development is largely determined for you because you're in a conflict zone and you're expected to be on one side and not the other, that almost becomes hardwired. So there's almost no difference between nature and nurture because the nurture is sort of hardwired, which is a scary. Yeah. 
you know, so so in terms of what is the divide between nature and nurture, in some places there isn't any. Okay. Which I think is counterintuitive. I don't think a lot of people think like that. Because there's this perennial, you know, are we more nature or are we more nurture? Are we more genetics? Are we more cultural upbringing? Because if your parents stay together, you get, you get their genes, obviously, but you also get their parenting. So how could you distinguish sure. in the first place? Okay, anyway. you, you talk to parents and in the plural. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's an, a kind of an absence yeah. in this book, um, and they're all on the periphery um, or they're outside <laughs> of... They're holding the siege line. Yeah. Which is... Males. Yeah. Okay. Why? Yeah. Why the absence of the male voice? It's about time, isn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> why the absence of the male voice? Because they're not the central characters of the book. They are the oppressors. Um, you know, the men of violence are returned home by the peace agreement. Either they've been released from prison or <laughs> they've been decommissioned from their guns. So they return to quite an alien world where they haven't spent much time in. Mm -hmm. And obviously, there'd be plenty of men who can probably adjust to that. You do a perfectly good job, but this her husband is not one of those men, and it's easy for him just not to be around. He can't, he can't do what he needs to do. He's much happier away in the old setup, yeah. which is male and yeah. you know all that kind of. Bravado. So who, who, who is you know? Uh, do you think there's a crisis point in, in kind of the patriarchy? In, in well, is there a male crisis? Was the sixties and seventies feminism discussing these things? Mm. I don't, you know, I don't think the situation's got any better. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the ideas are floating around. Forty three. You know, that's when I happened to read a lot of feminist texts. I, you know, wasn't reading them when I was writing this. Yeah. I read them earlier, I guess. And you know, because because I was a hands-on dad. You know, I think. That's what men should be doing. You know, why why should it be a gendered role? Yeah. Why why should it always fall to women? And obviously there are plenty of families where that's not the case. You know, I'm not saying it's all so it's just something I feel strongly about, I guess. Okay. So it's it's a, it's a, it really is a kind of novel of conviction and ideas yeah. and theories. We I, can use the word political, I know it's, it's a dirty word. Yeah, it's it's definitely socio political. Yeah. It's definitely um, a kind of breaking down of kind of binary opposites and, and, and things like that. Uh, and Again, it's that question of the universal rather than the individual. Yeah. yeah, okay. And so I just want to end it on this if, with you. What, what, what's your role then as, as a, I don't know if you like this label, novelist? Just throw it out there. Yeah, just throw it out just there. Just throw it out there and if people pick it up and read it, that's great. And if they want to start a conversation, that's great. If they don't, or if they don't like the book, well, you know. I can accept that. And do you write for a... I mean, I don't. Yeah. I, I write for myself. Yeah. Do you write with a, a reader no. in mind? No. So you write entirely for yourself? Well, any any project, no matter what its size, it can be a thousand word story or a novel, has a set... You know, when, it, when, when you have the idea or the conception for it, it sets up a series of artistic, literary, linguistic and intellectual challenges. And for me, the pleasure and satisfaction in writing it is to try and solve them. Mm. If you're solving a high 90% of them, uh, that's a pretty good rate. But that's where the satisfaction comes from. Your, your obsession with etymology is on Heideggerian proportions. The, the, the exploration of the meaning of words and where they came from. Yes. Is, is, it just permeates through the book. And not in that kind of, um, like, oh my god, not another kind of weird word. But in a, in a way that, it, I know you're not a kind of lyrical humanist in that sense, but in a very kind of poetic kind of way, there's a real kind of mellifluousness to, to the language, to the actual writing. It, it, it seems that it just pours from you, but in my mind I'm going, this can't, because this is, there's so much in there, there's so much detail. But we were talking earlier and you seem to go, well, you know, I have this, not ability, but this confidence of, of what I can do with language. Yeah. But so, is, is it... Well, first of all, language is the only thing on an author's palette. Yeah. There's nothing else. So all those structural scaffolding things of plot, character, scenery, they're, they're scaffold, they're tools, yeah. because you have to build them from words. Mm. Yeah. So that's the first thing. Second of all, we've already said that language is imprecise and elliptical and slips through our fingers, so it becomes even more important to try and nail it down. A futile task, I think, but one worth pursuing. Also, I think it's important to have a sense of play, because otherwise it gets very heavy. Yeah. 
And the fourth thing is, um, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, so the mother, who as I say has most of the book, she is surrounded all day and every day, because the husband's not there really, she's surrounded all day and every day by either pre-lingual or basic lingual children. And she, she has an affinity with language, but she can't use it during the working day because she's got two young kids. Therefore, she pours out into the journal. Yeah. And all her, her language, you know, it's a bullion language. Because the thing about parenting, I hope most people agree, is, you know, it can veer on the scale of absolute joy and euphoria. So complete exasperation, you know, that's, that's what parenting is. So her ebullience goes into the words, the facility of words that she has in her journal. Um, is the journal her true self, then? Is, is that who she is? Should we take... Well, it would be, but it's all out of order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's also, it's also a reference book. She's had the first daughter and noted down various things in her journal about you know, her relationship with the daughter and how the daughter develops. And then she has the second daughter. She goes back to the journal because what happens as a parent is every time the child moves on to a new developmental stage, it wipes the memory banks of what's gone before because it's, it's not needed anymore. So she goes back to the journal with the intention of just, you know, revise, oh yeah, that happened and this came before that, all that sort of stuff. But it's out of order. Mm. So that, that becomes problematical for her. Again, tying into kind of genetics and kind of codes. Oh yes, because we talked about, yeah, we talked about misprints. So the whole book originated <coughs> from thinking about genetic misprints and typos which obviously have a, you know, a very serious potential uh, consequence in a person's life. You know, if they've got a genetic mutation, it can lead to certain deleterious diseases. But equally, the whole history of evolution relies on genetic mutation, because that way you get variants of species and all that sort of social, not social, so all that Darwin survival of the fittest and all that kind of stuff. So there's that, there's that side of... of, um, of uh, the language, but it's it's not just. I'm oh, sorry, I've rather lost my train of thought. What were we talking about? Well, I, 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 oh yeah, misprints. Mis That's misprints. what it was. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to go. So, so there's the misprint in the genetics, which is both good and bad. Good evolution, bad hereditary diseases. But there's a section in the book about Jewish, ancient Jewish, and ancient monk scribes, long before printing, who physically transcribed the Old Testament, the New Testament, whatever the holy texts were. And if they made a single mistake. It was junked because they didn't have liquid paper. They didn't have correcting fluid, obviously. And you can't get the word of God wrong. You know, it has to be absolutely 100%. So there's that contrast between misprints and typos, which go through all throughout, you know, reproduction and DNA sort of dividing and, and, and reproducing, against typos which are not permitted yeah. by the tech, you know, pre-technological religious texts. If, okay, I'm going to end it and then throw uh, out to you guys if you have any questions. But for me, the idea that the genetic code can have typos yes. because you see it as language. Yes. That the geek inside me is just genius. <laughs> I love the fact that we're just a, a, a kind of smattering of typos in the room, which I, I think is wonderful.